what's happening, family? It's your man, CRB Jr. Here with the illustrious Al founder of American Dope Al Prophet. How you doing today, fam? Excellent. How about you? We have a good topic matter today. We do. We're going to talk about some, a theme we're going to be doing street, more. street stories. Now, we're going to talk about some financial freedom and how one gets it and why they can't get it and what's what's going on in these financial freedom streets of America. You got an interesting Yes, stat. so before we uh, trick you into joining our MLM. Oh yeah, you can hit the like, share, and subscribe before we do spit this knowledge though. And we do appreciate all the support. We're about to hit a milestone. But yeah, why don't you guys please hit that like, share, and subscribe because we're going to talk financial freedom and that is the name of this game. So, my uh, background's in economics and while that doesn't explain everything, it is a good way of knowing what's going on to some degree with human behavior. So find a very interesting stat that just some uh, economists figured out. Okay, so follow along here. So we know that millennials are people born after the year 2000. Uh, Gen X, which I think is me, are people born from maybe the early 70s up till maybe 90 and then comes Gen Z, whatever the case may be. So they looked at, the question was, is income mobility by race, is it changing? So do different generations... And Mr. Mr. Pro, Mr. Prophet, um, when you say income, you basically, can I translate that, it's people coming up. Okay, people it's coming people, up. So coming up, what they zero. looked at is, so they looked at, they divided by race, black and white, and then they divided by generation. Millennials, people born 2000 after, and people that are Gen X. I'm not sure what the years are, but there are people my age. I think you might. I'm the last of the boomers. I'm you 64. Are boom. I'm okay. the last of the boomers. You're not 64. 64. Oh, you're born in 64. 64. Okay. I'm saying. Okay, so I'm right. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, in uh, for Gen X people, which is the older group, a black person that was born in Gen X was born poor, so the bottom 20% of the income. By age 27, he had a 60% chance, he or she, of moving out of being poor. Okay. Upward yeah. mobility. Yeah, coming up. Coming up. A millennial black person, so a person born more, recent, more recently, mm -hmm. by age 27, well, I guess millennials couldn't start in the year 2000 because there'd be no 27 year olds. So millennials maybe start in 1990, whatever the hell it is. Mm -hmm. A millennial black person, has 66% of black millennials had moved out of poverty by age 27. So, so the likelihood is so if you're born poor, if you're black and you were born poor in 1975, you had a 60% chance to not be poor by 27. If you're born more recently, you had a 66% chance. So the income mobility of poor black people increased a little bit. Now what did you attribute that to? Well, that's a whole, well, well let, let me give the stat oh, okay. before we go into that. For white Gen Xers, if they were born poor, they had a 75% chance of moving out of poverty. So 15% better than black, so they're doing noticeably better. But a millennial white person has had it decrease Mm. Now they're down to 70%, so the gap was 15 points, the gap is now only 4 points. Black millennial has a 66% chance of moving out of poverty by 27, a white millennial a 70% chance. Translated both, now a millennial, a black millennial and a white millennial almost have the same yep. And the blacks statistical. have gone, have uh, the difference between an older black person and a black person now, their likelihood has increased. And the whites have actually decreased. It's not just they grew slower, it went backwards. And that ties into when you hear people talking about, uh, particularly in white working class America, doing I bad. was doing bad, I'm not gonna be able to do as good as my dad did. My not even being able to move out of poverty, or less is, likely to. You know, so that could be, now how much do you think as a, is one of the- And listen, non-college educated white people are the largest group of people in the United States. There's more white people, and not that, certainly there's other things you can do besides college, get a trade, go into military, actually work at a job, actually start a business. Yeah. I'm just using college just as a general, you got some type of training, let's mm -hmm. just say. White people that don't have any particular job training, Mm -hmm. There's more of them than there are all of the black people, mm -hmm. and all of the and, and, and probably all of the Hispanics put together. 
Well, I think blacks are only still, what, 15% of the whole? 13, Hispanics up to about 21. Of so the they, entire population? Yeah, so that, that's only still only a third of the people. Yeah. So there's more untrained, it doesn't mean dumb or anything, but untrained or lightly trained whites than there are all Hispanic and black of every demographic put together. So the white people that didn't go to college are the single biggest, or have some other training, are the single biggest group of people. So in terms of what's going on in American economy, they're the most important. I mean, not because they as individual human beings are more important, but just there's the most of them. Now, what do you, do you think your genre, or what you do as con content creators or just internet businesses have leveled the playing fields for the younger people? Or is, the, is that what There's not are? that many. There's a lot of, we think there's a lot of people with YouTube channels and making money and streaming because that's what we do and we interact with those people and we're in that world. But I mean, realistically, I mean, this Detroit's a, Metro Detroit's a big city. I mean, how many, YouTube. I mean, I don't even have a million followers. I mean, how many people with uh, 600,000 YouTube followers are there in Metro Detroit? You. <laughs> Me, I mean, I'm sure, <laughs> sure there's a couple others. Maybe not, not, not in this. A Anton, um, he Anton doesn't have Daniels. six, but he, I mean, he's doing his thing. Shout and I'm sure to, there's some reach out to you, bro, to Christian way. white woman. To talk. I'm oh, sure yeah. there's some, yeah. but there's not. A hundred. That's a fact. That's right? A fact. There's really the only place you're going to go where there's a whole lot of that is L.A. L.A., then, New York. Atlanta. Well, New York and Miami and Atlanta have some. Not like L.A. Not like L.A. L.A., like you go in a club and you'll be like, oh, like everyone here is some type of Inf influence. Yeah. So that's not what is driving those statistics. No. It's more traditional. No, no. For example, black women during over the last five years have seen a significant income growth primarily from moving out of lower paid, lower paid service sector jobs into the transportation industry, trucking. Well, I know that. Um, and these are these are stats from, I get my, when I'm talking about the economy, these are Bureau of Labor Statistics. Well, and just know what you just said, I just have to follow stats. my ex head of security. These are real stats. Big 6'9", out of Chicago. He's um, very familiar. He's and grown grew and up. developed since I've seen him. He is very much a growth. He's he's still growing and developing. My he man grew up in a growing and developing household. As well, he should. At, you know, and um, and um, all college. Though so we don't mind if he was black and growing and developing as well. Correct, and, and um, he still be watching those western movies, and he always liked the chief in the movie. Ah, yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. But he's now in the transportation business, and ah, he started truck, trucking. trucking. And he started telling me about five years ago about the increase in women truckers. And he's like, and a lot of black, lot of it's black, black women. women. And he'd be like, you know, they get their nails. Not that that's the no, easiest that's job thing. and all that, no, but it's, it's a good, easy good job. solid job. They make good money. He makes good money, and, the, and a woman who better is, than being working thirty hours at the counter at Wendy's. Not that there's anything wrong well, there. They're making significantly more. Than that's that. what I'm saying. That's a much better economic opportunity. Yeah. Not to mention, see the country, and if you like solace and most. So kind of don't things. as you watch these bitter, awful YouTubers. Speaking of YouTubers, who disparage every group of human beings, including me, you, black women. They just hate filled towards everybody and how women ain't shit and black women this and that. Yes, you can find people on the internet who embar are embarrassing and look horrible, but. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, several hundred thousand black women have moved into the transportation sector and it raised their income. So, and do you know what... So, to go back to your question as to why that stat we're talking about changed, well, that would be one, you know, those sorts of things. I think I got another one that attributes to that stat. Black women are the fastest demographic growing of entrepreneurship in America. And you have a, I don't know how much. Black women are sister girls, and I know sometimes people say I say massage. Well, you have a relative that's very, well, you have two. I mean, I come, from a, I come from a family of successful, my mom. Very successful. 40 year and your owners. other relative, will you want my, to keep my, a little my secret? My cousin's got one of the biggest cosmetic companies. Um, and if we said the name, you'd know it, but. Yeah, we won't because so she's got, yeah. she's, Come up so much political so, people, so, yeah. in this political season, so she knows who she is. Love yeah. you, love you to death, cuz love you to death. And I remember when when I was meeting you, you were like, "Oh, I'm helping with my niece, and she gotta get this yeah. sample from Guangzhou, and now here she is." Yeah, I mean, just just doing it. And, Big uh, deal. Like if we said the company, you'd be like, "Oh wow." Yeah, and that's his. Yeah, that's second cousin. Her mama. 
help raise me. Yep, and you helped her with her business. Uh, I saw it. Not did. that you made it. Oh yeah, but and I, I mean you helped her because um, I saw it. When um, you know, I did the pre coaching when she got on Shark Tank. She calls me twenty minutes. Oh, she went she, on Shark Tank. No, 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 she didn't take she, care of her. No, but it was a good experience. It was a good experience. They got it. Got her some exposure. Oh, it's marketing. She calls me twenty minutes before she's like, "Cause I need you to play Kevin O'Leary and Damon Johnson." I'm like, "What are you talking about, Cause?" She's like, "Oh, go, you didn't know you were I going go live. I go live in the Shark Tank." Um, no, in fact, she had a. Um, series of billboards that she was running throughout the city last those. year and one of them said two million units sold later thank you mr wonderful oh is that you that's mr kevin o'leary fell oh, 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 oh yeah yeah so no she didn't um so my mom my cousin um my sister you know 30 year plus law firm plus you know running running point on the family business so um Black female, my my mama's, my mama's aunt, who was the one who changed the trajectory, who told her, "Hey, while well, you guys got this money, you might want to get yourself and these kids the best education money can buy." Oh, because your mother went to college. My too. mother went to college, and so yeah, that money his father was generating and he had to sit down some years for. She she used it. One of the things she did was got herself a bachelor's degree. An associate and a bachelor and a master. Oh, I know. Okay, so great way to spend your money. Education can't and, take it away. And, and when they indict you, they can't seize that. That's actually what the woman I'm talking about, her auntie, told. They her. can't seize your education. Before we get back on that, the black female entrepreneur. So, and again, why I think. And don't so. let them tell you, oh, you shouldn't go to college. Some people may have opportunities where you don't need to go to college, but generally, going to college is, for the most part, a good decision. Not always. And we go into this in Beyond Street Dreams, but why our outcome, all praises to Allah, have been different than many families who were in the same lifestyle, was in 73... All of you got educated. 73, my mom's aunt calls her and says, Baby, y'all all on TV and on the newspaper." Right now, you still got a good hand. Was she one of the people down in the Carolina, or she was up here? In the Carolina. Oh, oh she was. And she said- Because they're all straight lace people. Yes. They weren't. No, at all. But none of that. She said, why you guys still- Nine y'all was involved. Right. Why y'all still got a good hand? You need to get yourself and them kids the best education money can buy. Geechee wisdom. Geechee wisdom. We come from the Rough rods. Around. We come from the Geechee Gully community. Me and my sister actually was talking about throughout the state in South Carolina buying some stuff back because both sides of the family. But we'll get our from South Carolina. Shout out to the Gamecocks. You know, that's right. Um, Geely Gutsy community. That's a football team. That is a football team. They don't be known. The University of South Carolina Gamecocks, yes. Um, but so with that, if black women are opening up businesses, right? Black women that aren't opening up businesses are going into higher income things like trucking. Those can help these stats make, yeah, every, make don't, sense. Don't let people, let, let them trick you into thinking everyone's twerking and all this other nonsense. No, and then you were, That's we, just who you see because that's who's seeking attention. And without getting too diverted, and we were just speaking off camera and about Making that twerking and all that dysfunction, saying that that's black culture like they that's do on offensive. YouTube, it's it ridiculous. is offensive. And only an ignorant, if you think that all this stuff, crime, gangs, and acting crazy in public is black culture, you're already retarded. Yeah. I'm going to be nice today because I was kind of mean and harsh because the senseless violence concerning Fulio's death had really upset me. I'm not going to shoot anybody through my door because I detest violence. Well, you meant that metaphor. Metaphor. <laughs> He's gonna shoot your loud voice. Yeah. Hey, get out of here, yeah, I'm yeah, calling the yeah, authorities. Yeah, exactly, but but the senseless, that senseless violence that you see documented, that's not black culture. It's chronicled because it is news, but that's not black culture either. And you're right, part it's of- street corner culture. Correct. And, and because uh, degenerate behavior, public, craziness has been glamorized uh, for black people. Other people do it. Correct. If you made a music video with a bunch of poor white people getting high and killing each other and going to funerals, it would simply look depressing. But if they dressed up like Bloods and Crips or they got Cardi's on, somehow it's, and somehow it's fly. Well, because so much it's just, that's just has become baked into the culture. Do I think it's a conspiracy? Not really, but maybe a little. 
<laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But on that, you know, hip hop in general is a at this because this demographic you're talking about is would probably be one of the largest demographics for hip hop music. Well, white white suburban white black are the biggest. Well, I'm not I'm including them in yeah. it. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um. It hey, used you, to be aspirational. I don't know if it is now. Well, and nah, that's I guess uh, maybe. You're like right. now, now, no, not talk about. Get, no, talk you're right. About getting that, that's high one of my transformations. And hurting used each other be and being in a gang isn't really aspirational. Yeah, that's not really aspirational. Uh -uh. The puffy era, and not to promote that, or Jay Z and Biggie and. and that's worshiping what, well, rampant materialism as its own downsides. So I'm not saying that's great, but that was aspirational. But Money man is aspirational. There's rappers now. Who I, are. I'm from that era, so that's where I still am kind of yes. stuck in that 90s. That's your Beatles. That's my Beatles, and everybody was talking about the proverbial come up. We, you know, birthdays was the worst days. Now we drink champagne when we thirsty. That, 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 that kind of thing. And, but I guess you're right. I don't listen to the new no, stuff. No, now the new, you know, a lot of new music is about, you know, my Switch and my A1s backdoored me. And it's a lot of dysfunction. I, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's a lot of embrace of toxic dis dysfunction. Yeah. I don't understand that publicly humiliating yourself. Listen, we all most do various bullshit in life, but the... But the talking to the gossiping about yourself is crazy. Well, you know, and I, we don't, I, we want to stick out kind of the economics. But on that note, calling your mothers, your sisters, your aunties, perpetually calling them female dogs, just always, yeah. always. No, do you, at some oh, point. Oh no, women have adapted. I'm well, a real no, bitch. All of that. I'm saying somebody on both sides, male and females in the culture, should take a step back and say, "Are there any other groups of people on Earth that do that?" No, it's crazy. Nobody. So if you're like the only, and it doesn't even have any shock value anymore, because you know there a lot of the people that are really talking like that all day, those words have come. That's how the N word passed into like. You could just be at a you know a ball and hear two fourteen year old Asians yelling to each other. Yeah. It's just these words that are actually were meant to be used defensively, like oh she's a bitch or this or that. The low life culture took over so much, at least in parts of the entertainment culture, that things that are supposed to be offensive are just the norm. It used to be <clears throat> a group of girls, another girl that they didn't like. Calling her a bitch or a hoe. Fighting word. Were fighting words. So I just called you a hoe. Now. That's it, my bitch. That's my bitch. These hoes ain't. Talk, calling your homegirl a hoe is. I'm a real. In fact, it's that you, you are yeah. giving yourself a compliment to say I'm the realest bitch. Oh, <laughs> which, just for, for anybody who didn't know, the, the dictionary definition of a bitch is a female dog. Please, I hope they knew that. <laughs> I hope that is just I'm I, I'm just saying I hope you knew that I'm just saying that but on the boss bitch boss this boss that boss is not everybody is not meant to be a boss and in fact or should want to be but there's that, nothing sorry. wrong with not wanting to be a boss that comes with a lot like I found I don't love having employee because if you're a responsible person, if you're a piece of trash who will tell people they work for you and then if you don't feel like coming to work, you just tell them, ah, fuck you, you ain't getting paid. But that's not a boss, sure. No, let me, let me. As, as but they, you work for your employees because now in the beginning, they've rented an apartment and they're expecting to feed their kids off. Oh, I come and Al gives me something to do and I get $800 on Friday. And if I don't feel like working that week myself well what do i tell these two people well no let Call, me, see you when i see you let me let me when you when you say you're working for them let me let me try to unpack that and i use a scenario that people can understand uh as most of you know who know anything about me i've had a couple different black and mild retail concepts right so i gotta rent a space fix up the store buy the signs buy the inventory by the time you have your first day at work, I am between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars already in the hole. You come to work for me. I've two weeks created late a situation for you to come to That's have right. a job, right? Well, two weeks in, 
you're going to get your check. Yeah, you're still losing. Does not matter what I made or did not make. Nor is it. Nor do you care. Can't tell a person at a retail. Oh, you know we were dead this week. I ain't giving you nothing. And and, and every boss knows this scenario. Friday has come and it's payroll. I'm at Fairlane Mall. I got three employees at my kiosk. Which I this is a real life. You've, you've had many this, stores. Right. I've got five employees upstairs at my other store. I have a twelve thousand dollar payroll to meet. We only did $8,000 for the week. And the vendors and mer people I got the merchandise from got to get paid. Guess who has to go in their pocket to cover that gap? Because what I can't tell the people is it was slow. I mean, that's a violation of labor law. I mean, not even that, but every it's immoral. And I'm not. I'm and just, you're not going to have any employees. I'm just trying to be. And this is why I, the word, and this is going to lead to why the word is lost any rate any connection to reality. 95% of all black businesses are what they call sole, sole proprietorships. That means the only employee of the business is that person. So all these people running around saying they're bosses, you're the boss of yourself. Well, you know, I thought You're not 1099 people, you're not contracting people. You gotta do all kind of, you, you don't have payrolls but you have lots of expenses because you have to I, deal with lots of I thought about the psychology of that because that's kind of what you're talking about. So, a boss really is for a certain type of job, is, is a assistant manager, overseer of get them hamburgers made, oh you ain't got nothing to do, mop up. So a lot of the people that like to misuse that word. I think they come from work environments mm. where they have someone hanging over their shoulder. Mm. Tell Gordon, what you doing right now? I'll yeah. get this. Oh, you oh, you did all the That's hamburgers I made? Well, go sweep okay. that up. Okay, keep going. The boss, if I'm a boss, I don't get told what to do, and I get to tell someone what to do. In a corporate environment or academic or like a real serious job, we know our duties. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Al, it's your job to whatever. Lou, make sure the store is closed up. Al, you handle in the inventory. You're not hanging over my shoulder, really. You may not I know see my your, duties. You may not even see your quote unquote supervisor. I may not have a really a supervisor. Uh, correct. I'm only going to come to your attention if you realize, well, Al hasn't been doing. Right. What's we it? didn't do. Yeah, Al's supposed to put up 10 pieces of social media content what? to advertise this place. And hasn't been done up are, in a month. And advertisers are bitching. And now yeah. it's came to our attention. Yep. Um, but I think that's a good point. I think. With the advent of this social media, you have a lot of people whose definition of quote unquote a boss and they get to tell people someone what to what do. to do. But which is a psych a lot like I feel for you. You've been maybe you've been being told what to do by people who are a little bit disrespectful to you or you don't feel that you should be under their thumb and then now you want to get but it's almost like a M O L E S T E R, like right? They say most M O L S T E R S it was done to them. So it's like there, now it's my turn to do that to a kid. If I was abused by a boss at work, now I want to talk crazy to someone. That's what I've always found that the best, well, the salespeople, so like in Neiman Marcus, I'll just get used to things I have real life experience. I used to sell suits at Neiman Marcus. We would get 10% off, every, know that. off gross, not net. That means if I sold a Versace suit that was $4,000. And you had a base. You got like minimum. No, no, no. Or if no. you sold nothing, you got no money? If you sold nothing, you didn't get paid. Oh. Which means it's for professionals. Oh, now, wow. the question is again, so where I'm headed with this. If I sell a Versace suit that's $4,000, I make $400 off that deal, right? But the good people at Neiman have got me the inventory. They do marketing and promotion. Oh, they're, they're paying for that big store in that expensive mall. They're throwing parties for my customers. They give me the ability to bring the suit to my customer. They give me the ability to ship. They're running the, ads. They're running ads. But every they have sales a relationship with Versace, because Versace's not going to send sucks. you a hundred suits to hold on to. And Versace, no, it's not going to send them to Macy's across the street. Right. So I get to piggyback on all that work that the founders of Neiman Marcus did. But I'm a partner. I'm really not an employee. Right. And that, that's so, um, 
I have observed it and it's just the truth. You know, we get off a lot in our community on sitting around passing out business cards. And you know, it's Brother Loop with his graphic business. It just amazed me how the first thing we want to do is get a business card and a flyer. We ain't got no inventory. We ain't put no money into marketing. We ain't ads. We ain't hired a consultant. Because I so desperately just want to be able to tell somebody I'm a boss and I'm in business. And I, I'm just saying that I get where that come from, but be, be careful with that. Business is a serious thing. And if you're not prepared to lose some money for a period of time. And you might not be able to take a vacation. I mean, I cost myself some money realizing I, I'm interested in a lot of things and I like doing them. You get different stuff started and you either get overwhelmed or you just want to break. But when you're, it's your business, Okay, I spent 20000 to get this thing kind of going, and now I leave it alone for two months. Dude. I, I just wasted my 20000 This is with the Pakistani plug supporting my business endeavors in Harlem. I opened up on 125th Street at the Mart on July 15th, 1993. I had a work ethic, though, and I wanted it to work. And even though I was living a very decadent party boy life, playboy life at night. I still wanted my business to work. I worked every day. I worked every day for four months. I think What's I took my first heat wave of pass. The heat is hot in Detroit. It's a hot summer like in sixty seven when they told when they when they, when they nothing left, there's nothing left to burn down or But anyway, yeah, yeah, you're right. You took so you you had one of those experiences also. You took your eye off the ball for a couple days. A week or so. Or just took a break. It wasn't even like a mistake. It was just like there's so much going on. You want a life of like you want to go. Hey, I want to go out to dinner with a woman or something. And you mean like, I can't just get five thousand? Instead, it's a, a Tuesday a night at ten. Um, no. No, you just don't get a half no. million subscribers and make documentaries. No, you don't. And post them. No, you don't. just well, 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 you can, but you got to degrade yourself or others, which <laughs> is what after what these people do to get popular on the internet. I'm sorry, it's what 85 percent of them do. In a certain demographic, but um, no, in all the demographics. I don't. But all, again, white comedians are beefing with each other. Um, I think that's a part of people. Oh, the the beef thing is all across every demographic. Right. I don't know. I think that you are a academically trained economist um, and that again we want to start to give you guys because we obviously as both of us being um, entrepreneurs and um, so on a well it's not negative it's a statistic but I think people should know this mm -hmm. so much variance in the geography America's so large there's different things going on in different places and I think it's important Atlanta Mm -hmm. which a lot of people think of as a mecca of black opportunity. It's not. It's a mecca of black people that already have something going on. But actually Atlanta has the lowest black income, because we started talking about income mobility. Right, right. Atlanta has the lowest black income mobility of any metro area in the country. If you start poor in Atlanta, you only have a 4%, talking about you're a native Atlantan. Wow. Born in Atlanta, 4% chance to move out of poverty. So Didn't you notice when you lived there that nobody was from there? Well, there was a layer yeah. of elite Atlanta people Correct. who were always elite. Correct. But the Atlanta hood people weren't the ones moving up into the, uh, you know, they were from somewhere they else. They were not the entrepreneurial class that Atlanta has become famous for. They weren't. They weren't the love and hip hop. Which is not a negative yeah. on them. It means it comes from something structural to the Atlanta I mean, it could be that the black elites keep such a, they're very insular. Their, their network, the network is not that open. Yeah, they're very, if you're not in one of those fraternities, sororities, certain churches. Churches. Um, why has the great migration to the A from Detroit, from New York, those people were coming there maybe, to say a little bit more sophisticated than the local people. I know the brothers who brought. But there's a lot of college graduates moving right. there for jobs. Or, or as the great migration from Detroit to Atlanta occurred, how many? I know five women who had thriving hair businesses in Detroit. They saw where everybody was moving or to. Or a friend with the car wash. A friend with the car wash. I mean, if you know, you know. Yeah, yeah. If you know, uh, you know. Uh, Oh, what was the other stand I was going to say? I'm sorry, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, that people. I think that makes sense. Um, 
I think that's where it used to even be a little animosity sometimes with the local. Oh, that's what I wanted to a stat I came across. So we're familiar with the what they call the great reverse migration, right? A lot of black people moving from the big cities of the north and the Midwest and LA back to the south. Detroit is the number one oh, city. That's a crazy stat. Crazy stat. Detroit is the number one city that has lost the most black residents since the year 2000, not that long ago. And New York's lost like 180,000, Chicago about 230, Detroit a quarter million African Americans have left since 2000. That's 250,000. Only 232,000 African Americans live within the city limits of Atlanta now. So more black people have left Detroit in the last 20 some years than live in Atlanta. Than live in Atlanta, the black man. That's cuckoo. Which shows you what this city used to be. So we're anybody my age or we're your age. We're not crazy when you be like, what happened? Where'd everybody go? Where'd everybody go? They truly they, did leave. The number one city for black population loss, Detroit, Michigan. Wow. Quarter million people in 20 years. So you and just, those are the quarter million people that had enough resources to, to move. You got to at least be able to pay for a U-Haul. Something. So this now. First last month, renting your new so city. So the poorest people are left. Which is very how visible. How many goods and services can you provide? To a city with a per capita income of 20, is Detroit's only like 22,000. I feel like I have forgotten how poor Detroit was. I was looking at Memphis's stats. And Memphis is a city with social problems, high crime, low income. And if you say Memphis, you think of oh, a poor city in the South, which it is. Their per capita income is 50, almost 50% 50 higher than Detroit. Ours is maybe 21,000, theirs is 30,000. So I think on that note, maybe another, shout out to Memphis. Yeah, another sh yeah, shout out to the Bobo family. But just saying, that's how poor Detroit is. Um, until except for when you, of course, see Detroit for a Tigers game, Lions game, or Pistons game, you are seeing Detroit between what you're they call Metro the seven. Detroit. You're seeing the seven point two area. But you're seeing people from outside of Detroit coming into the seven point two. And for people who aren't from the D. Then we're talking about the, it's called the 7.2. It's 7.2 square miles from the Detroit River. Where all the police are. To the boulevard from east to west from Trumbull over like the Shane. And it's where all the quote unquote gentrification. And it's a whole different city to be totally honest. It's oh, a different city well, no, than the rest you, of the if, city. If, if you. Rents are really gone, high. If you've been gone from here you, and I dropped you in downtown Detroit. You, you might not. You you look up and see the Renaissance Center, so you know you're there. But for those of you who don't know, the Renaissance Center is probably going to be demolished. Okay, that's the plan. So it's so vacant that once GM completes its move out to go to that new building that's being built, the Hudson Building by Dan Gilbert, which will be the tallest. They're talking about in the city. tearing tearing at least most of it down because they don't want to be stuck with another Packard plant. With right. another train station, I shot to the train station. They just revitalized. Oh, just be it's but it's set it's for you know forty-five years, years as an they, eyesore. Yeah, Packard plan is just now getting torn down. It's been abandoned since the late fifties. But don't be distraught because those of you who remember the Joe Louis Arena, former home of the Detroit. So not just because they tear down the Renaissance Center, they could put something. They're gonna else build. Up. I'm sure. It's but like I'm just we we're talking about it changing though. Yeah. Like yeah. that's gonna be gone. Yeah. Something else will be there, hopefully, but that's going to be gone. Yeah, uh, um, I was just, my family lives in that 7.2 area. God is good. Y'all have multiple residences. We have multiple residences in the 7.2. In the Mies van der Rohe. <laughs> Condos at Rivard's place, right there, Rivard and um, oh, Lafayette. Lafayette. One just literally, as we were, James James. On, we were um, looking at properties, one just came on the market today. One bedroom, two bedroom condo, Rivard and five hundred thirty-five thousand. Is that in the Mies van der Rohe or is that new construction? You know what I mean by the Mies van der Rohe. You know. That's where your sister and them left. That's that that architect. Architecture of all that, that little area. Pav yeah. Pavilion yeah. East yeah. West thirteen hundred. So is this place a new construction or is it in the Mies van der Rohe? It is, but it isn't. It's not because these are the townhouses. These are. It's like, not new construction. No. Oh, so five thirty-five for not new construction. No, this oh, wow. is, these are like when they did Hyde Park, Lafayette Park Place, and all. When of them. was that stuff done? That was after sixties. It was all all that stuff. That had BB's van der. I thought that was all done at the same time. Yeah. Or he just did certain. Buildings. I thought just that rectangular. You no, know, he did a few. 
Because as you notice, they're all the Lafayette they have a look. It's like a Bauhaus kind of look. Yeah. And 1300 Lafayette all have the exact same yes. architecture. But the townhouses, Hyde Park, um, Rivard Place, and those were all. The, well, they had a mistrial in that case over there of that. The, the Jewish woman was assaulted. Really? Merle. That Merle. was a big. That was a big case. Man, they, right they there died. in that 7.2. So when something like that happens in the 7.2. It's a thing, because those things aren't supposed to happen. A woman from the Jewish community, go ahead, well, she was, was assaulted She was assaulted found and dead in her apartment, and stabbed to death. They just put a, uh, I don't know if he's part, he had a Hispanic last name, but he looked black, but he said, I'm just a guy who breaks in cars. He admitted, and he had my cameras walking around, pulling on cars. Uh, but he probably found, he probably saw an open door Made a mistake, he stepped in, maybe touched her, but there was no real evidence again. He had some blood on her coat, but again, that would match if he went in. And they show him, he's going in cars, he stole some candy out of a car, he's walking, eating the candy. He certainly didn't appear to be someone who just killed somebody. And meanwhile, her one of her ex-boyfriends told the police he did it. But then he shows up with his lawyers two days later and said, he had done too much marijuana that day. <laughs> wow. So he had a psychotic episode. That's why I confessed to murder. Because I was smoking too much. No much but they had a mis mistrial. Yeah, the reefers. Reefers, reefers on YouTube TV, internet. TV. Banner, Ted TV, Facebook television. <laughs> so a mischild. I hope they don't retry. I was going to say, like, that sounds like the kind of case that's got to, someone's got to go to jail for that. Eventually someone has to go to jail for that. That's not a cold case they're going to let. Especially because, let's just all respect to my friends, just a very powerful community, and she was somewhat influential in that community. I don't well, it's still up to the Detroit homicide, be the ones who got to solve it, and they are not too good. Take it from me. <laughs> they're, they're not. You can have a murdered family member, and they don't have the death certificate, so they don't even have a case pending. Mm. How about that? Wow. I wow. experienced that. That, that. I said, what you mean it wasn't a homicide? I got the death certificate right here. Oh, we never got that. <laughs> um, so yeah, man. Hey, we need to take a picture before we leave. I guess I guess the people are seeing the out the backdrop of. Um, oh, this photo. Yes, but let me see the the book. Oh, good. thank you, sir. Luke, can, yeah. Yeah, I can take a picture. Yeah, of, uh, yeah, I'll take a picture. Yo, okay, man. All right, because people you think I have a ra a racist piece of artwork behind me in their office. <laughs> which was done by, shout out to Dawu Shabazz, the artwork that you're seeing sometime when Al and Al's backdrop was done by one of Detroit's fastest growing. And you people. provided this place for him as a studio for a while, right? For a long time, yes, for a while to get his... Um, What's his name? Dawu Shabazz. Um, I believe he and has... he's around, he has stuff for sale? He has stuff for sale, he's... Um, I want to say he's in the Kresge building now. Where's that at? Uh, right at Alexandrine and Woodward. He has his own gallery? In the, in his work part of the show work is there. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, Shout out to Dawood. Came out and when you see the picture of his artwork, it's about the black family being reunited and the strains that incarceration caused. So, no, Mr. Bradley is not. This isn't my secret white, white supremacy white headquarters. headquarters. But speaking of Black Forge, I think it's important that people, we mock sometime about reading, but reading is really important. And they've got all this stuff mocking reading. on audio book. Also, now they need to read it. Yes, you need to read it. It's called Black Fortunes, the story of the first six African Americans who escaped slavery and became. So these are all people that were born into slavery. Correct. Six different anecdotes of people who were born into slavery and then went on to accumulate a million dollars. Look, they're having fun. They got a fancy car, they got a mink coach, they're doing all the fun stuff. All the fun stuff. And this is a picture from probably the mid-20s. 20s look it's like. It's 100 it. years ago. People it, doing the same stuff. Riding Cadillacs and fur coats. And so I, I, I say that because legally. Born into slavery. Born into slavery. Um, yeah, none of their fortunes came from like boon, moon, boon legging. I mean, a couple of days. No. No. Some hotels, yeah, a light. hotels. That but they weren't criminal gambling. criminals. Yeah. No, no. And we're going to talk about that next time, though. But again, when you read this, I think it's inspirational for anybody. Please any start color, reading of any color, but something in particular. Read something. We are so now living this. Woe is me. Some, some of us, in some parts, 
and that the discrimination is the reason why people can't get ahead. And I'm not saying it don't. Oh, it's exist, real. It exists, but, but it, what's if, that going to make you give up? If people could be, 19, born, that's right. be born slaves, really, really, for real, for real. When they were lynching people when they were, and all when, that. I mean, born. When you were born, when you might go to vote, and there was a white man well, there with some shotguns and said, "No, you're not voting." These were people who were born when they weren't even people; they were property. That's right? They were three fifths of a human. They could be sold or traded for cattle. And children. Cattle. They, oh, you just had a baby. Let me see the baby. And they went on to accumulate a million dollars. So it it just really makes you ponder in 2024 when people say this can't be done or that can't be done. You know, uh, we joked, uh, we're, our, my, our grandparents, people like, um, our, all of us as grandparents. Well, my grandmother's say, born in dire poverty. We're called the greatest generation, right? She had to, she was as a child, and they were so poor, they didn't have toilet paper every weekend, they would be taken to Belle Isle, and they would steal the toilet paper from the public bathroom. And she homes. lived, obviously, during the Depression. Yeah, she lived in the Black Bottom, where 375 is, the Bowles. The Bowles. Her street was removed for... For 375, her we, eminent domain. We had a picture of her from about eight years old, say 1929. Teacher was black. Two thirds of the classmates were black. So I think she used to say she grew up at the edge of Greek time, but looked more like black man. <laughs> <laughs> same, same. Black here, black there. And then my grandfather on my father's side, we find out was passing. He was living at. Ten John R, which is Paradise Valley. Which is heart of Paradise Valley. That's right. Ten John R is the heart of Paradise so Valley. So I got a grandparent from Black Bottom and one from Paradise Valley. But that generation survived the Great Depression. World War II. And quote unquote kept the world Korean free. Korean War II. And World War II and Korean War. And, and the Communist Menace. Came back and created people like me who were born in what's called the baby boom. And then you look at what people in our generations have had to do or endure. And I, I'm one to say, I don't know if we quite measure up. We, we do a lot of, the generation that won World War II, that beat the Japanese Empire and the Nazi regime and survived the Great Depression, they don't do as much crime, I don't think, I don't know. But I, just observation, it's observation. People who grew up under Jim Crow. People grew up even beyond racial stuff. Women, listen, my grandmother mm -hmm. was making good money. My grandfather made her stop working because he was from the South. She knew. You know where they were going to buy a house at in the state of where they got the one in Warren? West Maple. Oh, come no, on. No, no. Guess, guess what sits where she was going to... Somerset sits on the land where she was going to buy their house but women in 1950s, wow. women's income couldn't be counted on a mortgage application. No women. Wow. Wow. So she knew she, she had wanted, to fork. The she, Messy of West Maple and John Arnold, whatever that is, it was the land where Somerset yeah. is. Yeah. Big Beaver, Troy. Or Big Beaver, 16 Mile, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Wow. Yeah. She knew. So that was beyond redlining. Women couldn't be on a mortgage yeah, application at all. But that generation, yeah, um, they did a lot. They, they, they handed future generations a pretty good hand. And sometimes I think, myself and all included, when you think about, we're going to talk about it in the Beyond Street Dreams, just that coming from that Jim Crow, it's not an accident that those guys that came out of Jim Crow, they was a little bit more serious about their affairs. Oh, that's very serious. About their affairs, you know what I mean? They didn't take their life. I don't even like that, to, to go back into our crime world a little bit, that referring to selling hard drugs on the streets of the big city or as the game, <laughs> I mean, I know we offhandedly sometimes do, but like, it's not a game. It is the farthest thing from a game. Going to the store in a lot of neighborhoods in Detroit to get some chips in a game sometimes. Correct. Least of all dealing in a business where since we can't take you to court for your mistakes. We will take your life. Or your right. larceny. And you will get killed. Man, you will get killed. And if I do something to you in this particular line of work, you can't call the police. Or how about somebody want to spend four hundred dollars and you pull up to serve them at two a.m. and they just kill you and take the four hundred dollars worth of drugs, which 
You, I, we always say it, you're more likely get selling $400 worth of drugs, you probably at a little more risk than I'm doing a $40,000 deal. Because in a $40,000 deal, we, we know who we are. There's only certain people even gonna be allowed into that. It's a, to be honest, and I know it sounds like fantasy land, they don't show it. I've been in, to quote Hova, I've been in rooms with enough stuff that if they kick the door in, everybody would get light oh, yeah. a thousand times, yeah, right? We, yeah. And people would come and the people were doing business when nobody brought a gun there and we didn't have a gun. Because everybody knew who they were. It, it, yeah, wasn't it was even, already it wasn't, beyond that. It was way beyond that. So yeah, the tragedies you hear, most of the tragedies you hear are ounce under tragedies. People getting killed. They're not brick tragedies. Those happen too now. Yeah, I know they happen. But, but... Well, yeah, at, a, at a certain level. Like that tragedy out of the state with your man, but that's another story. Trying to get in the street life for no good reason. Oh! And that, that one the, story, we won't go into detail, but that yeah. you always tell me about your buddy. The, yeah, I mean, the, the, the being a square businessman is a good thing. And doing well, and, and doing for some well. reason, at age of what, how old was he, 35, 40? Yeah, it'd be about that time, like about 35. Oh, I want to get in the, I want to get in at a high, not just, I'm going to sell a few dime bags, make an extra thousand a week. He wanted to run with the big boys. Yes. And he got ran right into the ground, literally. Because he ran it's not a game. Into the ground. Oh. It's not a game. Because in a game, you make mistakes, you get to maybe do the play over again. Oh, Charles, you feed me a chess court, and I'm, I'm, next time, I'm going to get you. That's right. Ain't no next time. I, you get somebody's half million dollars took from them and now all of a sudden you bring the law enforcement into those people's lives. <laughs> it can get, it can get so much realer than people Listen, realize. That, that scene in, cause at the end of Casino, yeah. when they're going to trial, well when things are unraveling and Andy Stone, who's been He's the older guy back east, mm -hmm. and the mob bosses are at their trial, and they use it as a conference, and they they're deciding what to do with people, and they say, well, what about what about Andy? He's a marine. He, he ain't gonna say nothing. Stand up guy. Next one, stand up guy, hundred percent. Third guy, he's fine. The fourth guy says, yeah, you're right, but the way I see it, why well, take a chance? And then it they cuts to the next <laughs> scene. Tap tap tap. Tap tap. There's people. That's why sometimes people have. You know, I make different friends in my field, or just being from Detroit. Sometimes my friends get too comfortable around me, or they, I might feel like they're about to talk about something that I have no need to know about. And I extricate myself because I would never want to be, when someone goes down their mental Rolodex of, who could have possibly leaked this information? You're, you don't want your they name on like, that list. No, nah, Al always left. He could, he don't even know. He wasn't there. He would always say, where are y'all at? Oh, I ain't coming over there. Hey, I'm You got to, listen, I'll pat people down. You got a good, no, nah, I'll ride with them. Hey. Like I'll the take way. an Uber. There's guys I know, I'm going to come pick you up, Al. Nah, I'll take an Uber because I know you get down and you, I'm, you don't need to change for me. But if I enter into your world, now I'm subject to your rules and I don't, but I don't, I'm not in that. So I'm gonna just take a Uber and then we can be friends when we get there. Facts. What was you no, saying, no, Big No, I was just <coughs> saying that uh, that sounds a lot like uh, what Pharrell would tell certain rappers who would get into certain situations around him. he say, before you say anything, if anything happens around me, I'm telling. he tell him right ahead. Or leave. My thing would be just, I'm well, not I know he, he, yeah. But he would say, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm but I am a, a I am a music producer. I'm, I am not a criminal, right. and I'm going to do what law-abiding citizens do, which is cooperate with the authorities. And I'm going to tell on you because everybody's not a victim. Right. Regular people that aren't victims, they may not want to be involved in criminal stuff and all that, but ultimately they're going to protect themselves. Yeah. I had never had any malice or hard feelings about any civilian back when it was okay to be a civilian, the civilians left us alone in our world and we left civilians Well, there's alone. so much of a, oh, like, it's like a but style But you are now. supposed to call the police and say they're outside selling drugs because you're a tax-paying citizen. Well, and you have a, a right to call the police and say with, they're outside selling drugs. You would keep miles. your black clean and the YBI said that we're going to cut the neighbor's grass and our grass. We don't want any 
any attention. Well, and we understand. You don't want to make it uncomfortable but, but for the neighbor. We understand you are good people, and we're involved in criminal activity, and we're bringing our hustle to your home, to your block. Tell them about that story about the guy in front of the spot. Which story? Where you, the guy was. Oh, on French Road, yeah. But so to finish on that, why we ran French Road, shout out to, to Eddie Baby. Um, shout out to Eddie Baby. Yeah. Um, and we got courses from our from our elders, but if we gon' of course we gonna make sure that the only people gonna break the law on the block is gonna be us. There ain't gonna be nobody getting beat up. There ain't gonna be no robbing and robbing and raping. And drug activities inside and the drug acid and it's cop and go spot. Cop and bop, as the Cavario would say. So this particular day, this young man, this situation you talking about, this customer decided he didn't. He was gonna break the rules and not cop and go. He was so desperate to get high. He was jonesing so bad, he had to duel, was they used to say back in the day, cross addicted. He had to cross addicted. Cross, cross addicted. Cross addicted, monkey on his back. So he had a spike in his neck. They had the, the boy. They had the boy. And he had the gizmo straight shooter in his mouth. And he so the needle was hanging out of the neck. He literally was lighting. He was lighting this, the gizmo. That's sad. We That's wanted, quite a scene. I mean, but obviously drugs of. So you went out. So did he get roughed up? Oh, um, y'all just threatened him with a roughing up. Or just a light. Shout out to uh, Giggle Rock, Tony Mac. Giggle Kurt, Rock. Giggle, who's um, That's a hell Kurt, of a Kurt, 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 Kurt Richardson. Giggle Rock. A.K.A. Giggle. Okay. Uh, shout out to Anthony Richardson, A.K.A. Tony Mac. Shout out to uh, Black Jesus, a.k.a. Wani Poo, a.k.a. Wait, Black Jesus, a.k.a. Wani Poo, that's two good names. <laughs> Black, Je Black Jesus, a.k.a. Wani Poo, a.k.a. Dennis Richardson, shout out to them guys. They don't make nicknames like they used no. to, now everyone's just Little Little J. Nah, now nah, you had to earn your name back then. You had Black to. Jesus, a.k.a. Wani Poo, I left <laughs> Um... They went. They went to. They did. And the thing is, they grew up their whole life on oh, the block. Yeah, yeah. So, so they, that's they, their neighborhood. They, that's their neighborhood. All those old people, Mr. Rufus and all, Mr. Rufus and all them people. The people we talk about that we buy, they play their numbers for them and mm. make sure the lawns were cut on everybody. Ain't no ice cream man. We can say this for sure. From 1990 to 2010, the ice cream truck never came down the street and a kid on French Road had to pay yeah. for their ice cream. That didn't happen on the block. That was our, our obligation Period. without question that when the ice cream man come down the block, all y'all, all y'all, and the ice cream man got to the point, if he didn't see us, they just give him something. He give him, him loop the block, loop the block a couple times, and then when he'd see on the car, 52. $50. I'm fine. You know, 60 man. It's your hip, as you say. It's your hip and no hip. Because, I mean, at least you can do, man. You're doing 30, 45,000 a day on these people block. Uh, and we, the ice cream. Uh, you can't buy the kids no ice cream. But, yeah, they, uh, Wani Poo and them, they, um, as soon as they saw it, they freaked the hell out. They ran out the porch and. I think he had his door, his window was half down, and but he had enough scissors, he had his door locked, so they went to pull because they was Jacob, and they might have reached in there, they might have slapped the gizmo out of his mouth. But, but he had to do it again. No, and their rage was appropriate, dude. Well, that'll make a police don't want truck. That in a neighborhood where everyone don't just don't need knows this. what's going on, but it's pretend, listen, they ain't causing no problem, we're going to drive past here. Now we got to... Well, back then they couldn't ride past someone. Nowadays, you walk around, people doing drugs openly. <laughs> but but, but right, circa '95, the police are not going to pass by a it's man. It's a sad with a crack. state of addiction. If a needle hanging out of your neck and a pipe in your mouth, sitting in a car in daytime, I assume. Yeah, broad daylight, two and a two and afternoon or something like that. But I'm um, very glamorous. I mean, no, I get, welcome to San Francisco and Portland. Oh, so welcome, like, to, welcome to downtown LA with my three thousand dollar apartment. Was. Right, it seems. That, oh, I saw. It seems America has normalized that when kind we of were behavior. All, now. When we were in Washington Heights, I, when I walked to the car, there were people shooting up on the sidewalk. No, I, you know, I things, man, things, things have changed. Um, so it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, What's the name of that book? Black Fortunes. Read it. 
Uh, Shamari Wills. Yes, Shamari Wills. Um, for real, 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 very inspirational. We're gonna do more. We gotta talk more. Get the people. That's all we're talking music. about, man. I'm crammed out. We're crammed out for I the, mean, you know. the bag been moved. We will. We'll, we'll, get we'll some, do some gypsy bags. Some like. gypsy bags here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you all right, you. Lou, you got anything else? Oh, yeah, Mama's book still out. KarenKnoxOutCancer.com. Oh, yeah, check it out, check it Please out. Please check it out, the book. Great story about the indomitable human spirit. Um, Brother KK again, August 3rd, Saturday, I-75, and Matt Brewster's um, fundraising basketball game. Well, it's more of a tribute. Every year, Brother KK does it, who has also has a great book out, If These Bricks Could Talk. Chronicling his KK Newell, KK Newell brother, brother served as the loose inspiration for the character King. Uh, R.I.P. Lawrence, um, and um, son of Big Nose, a little another project. Big K. Nose, Big Nose, um, project legend. Also went to school with Pops Miller High. Went to Miller High and all the way back to actually Bishop Grade School. A lot of my friends' mother, grandma went to Miller. Dodo, heard of him. James Foster, another Detroit legend. That's your Illich conspiracy theory thing, but we won't get also into Also Bishop Elementary Miller High School. Where was Bishop Elementary right now, Sam? I think it's right where Spain or I think it's right, it's all oh, right okay. there. Well, because Miller was more, wasn't Miller on like... Pat Rob, TV, Van shout out. Van Dyke and Grash or something, or where was Miller? Was it Van Dyke and Grash? No, Miller's on Shane. Oh, it was on Shane. Shane. Grash it? Between Vernon and Grash it. Oh, okay. Historical site. Alumni of what is it Coleman, now? Coleman A. Young, alumni also. Oh, what built is it? Is this a lat now? Yeah. No, no, they can't tear it down. It's um, oh, it is like a plant. It's like oh, yeah. Miller, 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 Miller High School is. Uh, Listen, we hit. No, we got to go out in the streets one day this week and do some street shit. Yeah, street yeah, yeah, yeah. Miller, Miller High School is. Oh, to do that. Is uh, y'all? We got. Listen, Lou and Courtney like to get late starts, especially Lou. So one day this week we got. Courtney get, runs multiple. No, affairs. we know. <laughs> we know. Yeah. But we gotta get like maybe if we can get together by two. Oh, did we ever? What's up with Wayne State? Y'all, they gonna have it when when Beyond Street Dreams come. What Wayne State got gonna be had? Believe that. Write that down. Did we? We gotta go down there. Right? We gotta go down there. Now. We are in the fourth quarter of putting together a long awaited, much anticipated doc. Never to be duplicated. Never to be duplicated. Cause Beyond it's Street story. Dreams. Yeah. Go uh, to the, go, where can they go sign up for the emails? At BeyondStreetDreams.com. 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 Yeah. Beyond so we put your email in now, you get discounted tickets and merch when it comes out. And um, the world's coming our way. You did a great post, and uh, we'll probably share some of it too about the upcoming Peacock um, miniseries. The big fight. Fight night. Kevin Hart. Oh yeah, Fight Night. That's what's called. Kevin Hart playing. Samuel Jackson playing Frank Hart. Bolton. Yeah, Samuel Jackson playing Frank Bolton. Kevin Hart playing Chicken Man, and because we real guys, we know real people. So I'm getting calls from Atlanta. From shout out to uh, Tyrone Stevens. Oh, Tyrone did someone? Did him. they see that? Well, Chicken him? like Chicken Man's his man. Is he still alive? Chicken Man. Chicken Man's still alive. Oh, that would be dope to interview him. Um. Like we had just so many people who were Did like this, on the way to. So I could interview him, Ray Tatum, and shout out to Ray Tatum and, and, uh, and who's the who's the who's our pigeon drop? What's his name? Tyrone Steve. Tyrone. It'd be worth going down three of them, and then Supreme Junior wanted to meet me down there. That's four people right there. Yeah, I mean, hey, Atlanta, rich history. So um, still has less the, African Americans than left our fair city yeah, just in the last twenty years. But that, that it shows again that the. America's fascination with that golden era. That Very we interesting time of tremendous social change. change. And we're going to chronicle all that in Beyond Street Dreams because obviously we were at ground zero. We were living in as the history was happening with the Nixon administration, that China white bag. The black French capitalism. Black capitalism. Coleman Young black said, power. What's your money, black man? Black man, Taylor Lagarde just chimed in. He just he just said, what's up? Oh, well, my man, I did that commercial for them. You did. It said, again, the world is so small. With the jumping dog. That's right. Lagarde vest, me and Ted, well, we basically family. My brothers from different mothers, um, the Lagards and, and the Brown family go back 40 years. Me and Ted did. Uh, we went over to China together, actually. Oh, um, oh did you have the source? 
Ted, Ted supports. So they have a dog training vest that made a uh, info merchant for them. Yes, yeah, so you can look it up. I think it's Lagarde. What did they do? They got in Petco or something? Yeah, he's still in. He's still. They're still adding there. They're in some of the local, I think, Petco's. And I know you can definitely get it online. I think at Lagarde Vest. Dot com, but Ted supported my consulting business, had faith in me, um, paid, hey, me, that, paid that, me well to take him over to Asia to share my um, product came out, they my, got infomercial from me, did from you. So and definitely shout out, out to Ted. Shout out to Ted me Ligera. and Ted are involved in some real estate activities still together, so shout out to all. I was with the big homie earlier. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, shout out to the big homie. Shout out to the big homie. Yeah, for sure, for real, for real. Those that know, know. Um, the don't, won't, won't. <laughs> Facts. Um, so, yeah, so look forward to that because we have a lot more stories coming up. So, you guys who are kind of excited or seeing the trailer for Fight Night on Peacock, we got. Go watch, some, go to my channel, watch it. Yeah, go to the channel, go to American Dog. The Dope real store. We got more stuff coming. We got access to the people who were. Hard salute, American Dope, our profit, big boss. All day. Like, share, subscribe. How'd you man? Give them one quick shout out. Um, Shabazz's photo if we can, bro. Yeah, yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is Dawood Shabazz. The name of my business is Dawood Shabazz Art. I'm the artist of this painting here, which is titled Tears of Fear. And this painting explains on how the struggle is between family when the sole provider for the family is taken away. So uh, this represents on how a man decides to um, how he decides to take care of his family. And sometimes you're taking a chance and you might get caught up in the system and then taken away from your family. And as you see the man, he's letting the, he's letting the wife know, I've been, I'm, I'm gone, but hey, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a struggle and it's an emotional feel, feeling that I have been taken away from my family. And then also, you know, it affects not only him, it affects each individual within the family. So that's why the tears is amongst their faces and then it, it shows red because sometimes through that struggle of 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 a uh, of pain, it it can become so much of tears it become into blood, which is a, which is a hurting to the whole family. So I titled this again, like you say, um, tears of fear, oh, okay. I mean, tears of struggle. I'm sorry, tears of struggle. You have a uh, you have a, a exhibit coming up. Yes, that is right. I have an exhibit coming up right now. Um, be August 3rd and 4th at the Belle Isles um, Island. It's an art fair that happens every year. So every I'm year. So um, I'll be having the tent there this year, um, August 3rd and 4th, which will be a Saturday and Sunday. Um, the hours may be from 9 to nine to 10, I believe, in the morning. Um, and then on Sundays um, from 12 to 5. So this is August 3rd and 4th at the Belle Isles Art Fair. That's what's up. Well, I appreciate you uh, letting us know about this artwork and uh, and uh, the, the good people out there will get a chance to see some some more of your stuff. Yes, they will be seeing some much more creative work that I'll be creating on canvas. This particular piece here is created on Masonite, which is a very archival material. That, that sounds expensive. Like yes, it is. You see how large it is. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, much much appreciated much peace to you thanks a lot thank you for having me yes all right big boss film works big lou in the house